The 1990s produced a golden age for action cinema. James Cameron pushed action filmmaking technology to new limits. Michael Bay unleashed his trademark frenetic style on audiences, established marquee names like Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone, Harrison Ford, Mel Gibson, and Bruce Willis continued to rule, while newer faces like Keanu Reeves, Wesley Snipes, and Will Smith demonstrated they could hold their own when it came to big screen action spectacle. But no other 90s action movie was as batshit, bug nuts, over the top ludicrous quite like John Woo's Face Off, which offered two Hollywood heavyweights swapping skull skin to play each other's characters. Release the pigeons and take aim at what the fuck happened to this movie. Like a lot of action scripts in the late 80s and early 90s, Face Off began as a response to Die Hard. After that Bruce Willis movie became a huge success, studios were clamoring for the next similarly high-concept potential blockbuster, and were throwing around large sacks of cash trying to find it. In 1990, fledgling screenwriters Mike Werb and Michael Collieri got together and tried to come up with their own special twist on the action formula. What they started with was essentially Die Hard in a Prison, a sort of futuristic Birdman of Alcatraz, partly influenced by the James Cagney gangster classic White Heat, John Frankenheimer's unsettling 1966 thriller Seconds, and the real-life Attica prison riot in 1971. Their story would follow a law enforcement agent going undercover behind bars, which expanded to also have the criminal he was impersonating infiltrate his life outside prison. The writers had wondered why a movie bad guy couldn't be as interesting as the good guy, which evolved into why can't the bad guy be the good guy? It then became a matter of figuring out how to believably switch the hero and villain. They considered identical twins, voodoo, yeah! or a personality swap. But Werb had another fascinating, if gruesome, inspiration. An acquaintance had been in an accident, and surgeons had to peel off his face to reconstruct the underlying bones and tissue. Since their movie would be set decades in the future, a seamless face transplant operation became a credible and logical sci-fi solution. Once a solid draft was finished, the writers did not have the best luck despite expecting offers to roll in immediately. Their agent had decided to distribute the script in the middle of January 1991, on the same day when U.S. President George Bush launched Operation Desert Storm in Iraq, and Hollywood was too preoccupied with the state of events to consider screenplay purchases. Ultimately, action super producer Joel Silver optioned the script and set it up with Warner Brothers, who had released his Lethal Weapon movies. But the experience with Warner Brothers proved to be a disheartening year and a half for the writers. The studio was already working on another futuristic clash of A-listers, the Stallone Snipes Smackdown Demolition Man, and they were primarily focused on that instead. In addition, Warner's executive was concerned that the face-swapping effect could not be convincingly achieved with prosthetic makeup, somehow completely missing the concept of two actors simply playing each other's parts. After the rights reverted back to Werb and Kaliri, the project landed at Paramount, and actor Michael Douglas joined as a producer. Douglas was impressed with the script, but urged the writers to shift focus from action to the psychological thriller aspects of the role swap, which he suggested would present a uniquely intriguing challenge for potential actors. While the writers continued tinkering with the script, they also began bringing the story closer to present day, ejecting some of the more elaborate and expensive sci-fi elements, like organ banks, holograms, flying vehicles, and chimpanzee slave labor. Only the high-tech ocean penitentiary and the implausible medical procedure remained, concentrating more on the characters while significantly reducing the budget. The first director attached was Rob Cohen, back before he fueled up the Fast and the Furious franchise. The writers were not wild for some of Cohen's ideas, like the rivals teaming up in the climax to defuse the bomb, which had become sentient. When Cohen later departed to make Dragonheart, he was replaced by Marco Brambilla, who had, ironically, directed the movie that stonewalled face-off at Warner Brothers, Demolition Man. Werb and Kaliri had stars in their eyes, specifically larger-than-life action gods Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone, who they had always envisioned playing the role-switching hero and villain. When that muscular matchup proved unfeasible, Bruce Willis and Alec Baldwin were considered, and the writers also suggested to Michael Douglas that he should star opposite Harrison Ford. But to their dismay, the director and studio wanted two younger faces to take off. Nicolas Cage was interested in the project, but Paramount was skeptical. 
At the time, Cage was mainly known for his quirky character work. He had yet to collect a statue for leaving Las Vegas or establish his action aptitude with The Rock. The studio agreed to cast Cage only if he starred opposite Johnny Depp. Michael Douglas even personally approached Depp while he was filming Nick of Time in an effort to convince him. But allegedly, the title Face Off had given the actor the impression it was a hockey movie, and he passed after discovering it was not. With Depp's rejection and Marco Brambilla no longer involved, the project made its way to Hong Kong bullet ballet virtuoso John Woo. And not for the first time. Woo had been approached and was interested back when Joel Silver had the script. But although the director had more than proven his action abilities with innovative heroic bloodshed classics like Hard Boiled and The Killer, he had originally passed because he didn't yet feel capable of making an ambitious futuristic science fiction movie. But now, with the story becoming more contemporary and grounded, aside from the preposterous face exchange, Wu was more confident in doing justice to the concept. At that time, he was making Broken Arrow with John Travolta, who was surfing a career resurgence after Pulp Fiction and Get Shorty. Travolta had long been infatuated with the idea of playing both good and evil twins, and the identity trade of Face Off presented a suitably juicy opportunity. And based on his experience making Broken Arrow, he was enthusiastic about working with John Woo again. Not long after, Nicolas Cage circled back to the project. By this point, he already had one action hit under his belt and was working on another, the prison plane epic Con Air, which he actually finished filming on the day before shooting his first scene for Face Off. The two actors reportedly bonded immediately and began intently studying each other's mannerisms, deciding which notable idiosyncrasies to incorporate in their depictions of each other. Although they share a number of scenes together, they would also watch each other's performance during filming to make sure they were capturing the right essence. Travolta, who Kaliri described as a natural mimic, did have one minor concern about the script, specifically the reference to his ridiculous, ridiculous chin. chin. But the writers assured him he was famously handsome, and that Castor was the kind of narcissist who would complain about someone else's good-looking face. Despite the studio wanting a younger actress, Wu insisted on the Oscar-nominated and age-appropriate Joan Allen to play Archer's wife, Eve, and Dominique Swain was cast as rebellious daughter Jamie in her first screen role. Alessandro Nivola would play Castor's timid brother Pollux, while Nick Cassavetes and Gina Gershon were cast as sibling criminal cohorts. Cassavetes said he got the job when meeting Travolta on the set to discuss post-production on his directing effort She's So Lovely, and Wu convinced him to stick around and play the grinning bald bad guy. Unlike many expensive blockbuster productions, where the original screenwriters are almost immediately rewritten by others, Werb and Kaliri remained on the project since its inception, and later estimated they wrote over 30 drafts through its lifespan. The pair was even paid to be on set during the entire shoot to make any necessary changes. As Kaliri put it, people recognized they couldn't rewrite this script without really fucking it up. The writers worked closely with John Woo, who was clearly competent in regards to action but wanted to add more humanity, personal stakes, and emotional drama. Most of the major script changes would be in service to the characters. The ticking time bomb that sets the plot in motion is inconsequential by the halfway point, and the hero spends the rest of the movie trying to reclaim his stolen life from the villain. Wu and the writers decided the flashback sequence, where a mustachioed Castor Troy inadvertently murders Sean Archer's young son, should move from the middle of the movie to the opening scene, establishing the hero's motivation and the villain's dastardly depths right from the initial moments. It was also the director who came up with character flourishes like Castor tying his brother's shoelaces and Archer's weird hand gesture thing. Wu also encouraged creative freedom for his cast, which prompted that memorable full mouth smooch that Cassavetes plants on the lips of his sister. But perhaps unsurprisingly, it was Nicolas Cage who was ad-libbing like a madman throughout the shoot, like Castor's manic singing at gunpoint in the airport hangar, and the iconic moment where the incognito lawman states the movie's title. I'd like to take his, his face off. An exchange that Cassavetti said they improvised variations of for 10 straight minutes. At one point later in the film, Cage was going so bombastic with his performance that Mike Werb had to remind him he was supposed to be Archer in that moment. Werb called John Woo an endless fountain of exciting new ideas, and while many of the movie's action beats were in the script, the director constantly escalated the mayhem with additions like the game of chicken on the airport runway and the speedboat plowing through a police boat in explosive fashion. 
One troublesome detail was figuring out exactly how Castor would be incapacitated at the start. Initial ideas involved freezing him in liquid nitrogen, sending him plunging off an air traffic control tower, or electrocuting him on high voltage wires. But none of the options satisfied Wu until they eventually came up with tossing him down a turbine tunnel. With the film packed with gunfights and chases and explosions and more gunfights, there wasn't always room for more. One extended sequence would have seen Archer, as Caster, escaping the prison in a stolen helicopter, engaging in a dogfight with pursuing choppers, and crashing in the water before making his way to an undersea train tunnel. Although it was storyboarded, the section reportedly would have cost a million dollars per minute. Too much for a movie that was already considered risky at $80 million, leaving the escape limited to the character leaping from the oil rig prison. Wu thought it was best to let audiences fill in the blanks, figuring if they had bought into a face-switching operation and a prison with magnetic boots, then they were already along for the ride. For the loft shootout, the director came up with the impromptu idea to put Castor's abandoned son right in the middle of the chaos, an innocent contrast to the carnage around him. The studio was against the idea, but Wu wanted it so badly he even offered to pay for the scene himself. Eventually, the studio relented, and Wu replaced his first choice, Puff the Magic Dragon, with the song Somewhere Over the Rainbow to play in the boys' headphones, a reminder of his own childhood affection for The Wizard of Oz. It was a minor miracle that the loft footage was even visible. It turned out that the art department had plastered over the bullet hits, causing dense clouds of dust and shrapnel when they were triggered by the effects team. Luckily, the cameras did successfully and clearly capture all the pandemonium, although it would ultimately be too much for the MPAA, who required the bloodshed of the entire sequence trimmed in order to receive an R rating. Shockingly, we almost did not get a glimpse of Wu's signature slow-motion doves in Face Off. The film was running behind schedule, and a producer was concerned that trying to get birds to cooperate would cause even further delays. But when the producer had a change of heart the next day and authorized the feathered extras, Wu was elated. Despite the production's prodigious cost and complexity, by all accounts it mostly went smoothly. The actors all had a blast working together, and Wu was so confident in their talent that he typically only required a single take. Everyone involved, from the writers and producers to the stunt crew, had nothing but praise for the professionalism and creativity of the director. John Wu said that when the pressures of such a massive undertaking occasionally got to him, John Travolta would notice and go out of his way to cheer him up. For the most part, the studio and producers gave Wu the support and means to achieve his vision. Michael Caleri described the experience as, quote, a testament to the way the system should work in Hollywood. The movie zoomed through post-production. Principal photography finished on April 1st, and the movie would be unspooling in theaters less than three months later. But Wu had been essentially cutting the movie in his head while filming all along, and would work with the editors each day after shooting to assemble footage. By the time production wrapped, Wu had a fine cut that needed very little further finessing. Although there was one particular issue, the ending. The original script had the restored Archer bringing home his arch enemy's orphaned son, but the studio was certain that audiences would be appalled by the idea and insisted on something else. In its place, Wu filmed a Hitchcock-inspired ending where Archer sees Castor in the mirror and it finishes on what could be perceived as a sinister smile. But test audiences disliked the enigmatic ending, and two-thirds of responses wanted to know what happened to the boy. The studio accepted their mistake and paid to have the original happier ending filmed. Paramount released Face Off in theaters on June 27, 1997. The movie opened in first place with $23 million, and positive critical response and audience word of mouth gave it stamina through the summer, finishing with $112 million domestic and $245 million worldwide. One reviewer praised Paramount for approving the strangest studio film ever made, and indeed, as big-budget action movies seemed to be getting more formulaic, Face Off offered something audacious. At the time, and in the years that followed, movie fans embraced the absurd but masterful blend of scenery-chewing, family melodrama, kinetic action, and a bonkers core concept of a melancholy federal agent and erratic lifelong felon exchanging faces and lives. Director John Woo followed Face Off with the box office hit Mission Impossible 2, but after the poor reception to his expensive war movie Wind Talkers and sci-fi thriller Paycheck, he returned to Hong Kong for the well-received period epic Red Cliff. A remake of Face Off has been constantly rumored over the years, but the latest report is that Godzilla vs. Kong and the guest director Adam Wingard is working on a direct sequel to the original movie. 
With Nicolas Cage still a prominent part of pop culture, the return of Caster Troy could possibly work somehow. But whatever happens, more than 25 years after its release, Face Off remains one of a kind.